So I'm here to talk about server-side Swift and actually Swift in general. There's a few Swift people in here. I was talking to some people at the back and they were asking, actually asking me about Swift and whether you, what, what uh, all the good things about Swift. And so I'm here to promote Swift, but I'm not actually part of Apple, I'm part of Perfect. What's interesting is I'm actually talking about a very specific part of the Swift world, which is server-side Swift, which is a new thing. I'm gonna talk about a story of how we got to where we are. Um, I, obviously, everybody in this room knows other languages, and I, I like to look at it as we currently have sort of a fragmented thing happening. Whereas if I want to build, especially in a mobile platform or a mobile uh, application, I end up having to rebuild my app in multiple languages. So I have to have a whole bunch of skills. We all know this. We've got our, our back-end team, we've got our front-end team, we've got our, our Android team and our, our iOS team, and in some cases, we, some cases you'll have a full-stack person that knows all the things, or you've got different people working even in different offices, all with different things, trying to send JSON back and forth or something like that. But right now, everything's sort of all over the map, and I want to talk about how this might change. Obviously, there are some uh, some isomorphisms like Java and JavaScript, um, where you can use one language for across multiple things. But the fact is we have all these different teams and all these old languages all trying to sort of make them work and there's some new great things coming out like Go, et cetera. Uh, but I, there's room still an opportunity to come up with, or has been come up with a beautiful language. I wanna talk about this new language, which is Swift. I'm just gonna talk quickly about it because some of you have used it. If not, there's a lot of stuff out there about it. But what you probably know or don't know is that uh, Apple came out with this language. It's a brand new language a couple of years ago. And in fact, it's an iOS language you can use to build on, a, on an iPhone, obviously you know this. Um, but it's got all these nifty things about it. And how I, what I think happened was there's this realization of all of these really cool things in different languages. And you're seeing this now with Go and Rust and, and Swift where people said, hey, let's, let's see if we can take all these great ideas that have been around now for a couple of dec decades and converge them into new and better ideas. And so now enter Swift, and of course it's statically typed. Uh, it's very different, it's, it's almost like pseudocode, it's beautiful to read, it's got a lot of guts underneath. It really is a truly beautiful language. And I'm not gonna go through all of these great reasons why you should use Swift, because you could go find these on the internet yourselves, there's lots of people out there championing it for you. A big massive inflection point happened, I'm not sure if that's a big massive thing, an inflection point happened, which is last year, Swift actually announced, or Apple announced, that Swift is gonna open source. This is like a mind-blowing moment for us, because we realized maybe the language, which is a beautiful language, could be used not just on the iOS device, but somewhere else. Um, and in fact, if you look now, a couple of years later, you'll see that in fact the largest job increase, if you're looking for a job, a great skill to have is Swift. Swift users, are, are developers are like unicorns these days, they're hard to find. And server-side Swift guys are like unicorns pets, they're like unicorn unicorns, they're, they're very difficult to find. And there's been a huge increase, of course, uh, uh, when Swift first came out, uh, there was this incredible surge of people on GitHub uh, starring it and supporting it, and there's been more commits, I think, to Swift in the last two months than there have been to any other project on GitHub. I think I just read that. I mean, it's amazing how this has caught on with a number of different people. I do want to tell you a quick story, though, just for a couple of minutes before I let uh, a real developer get on board. i talk to you a little bit. Back in uh, 1975, you may have heard of this company called Apple, who don't realize how old, in fact, it is. Uh, Jobs and some other guys, other Steves, started the company. Fast forward a little bit, of course they had a great product, they brought a board, they got financing, and the, the Steve Jobs was asked to step down. You guys have all read different books and they've watched different movies of how this happened, you probably know better than me. Um, but they put in a new CEO, which is John Scully. This is the CEO of Pepsi-Cola. And, uh, and he took over, and, and, and of course the first Mac came out, there's all sorts of stories around this. Um, but he didn't really have a great time at Apple anymore, so he left, he resigned. And so he left the company in John Scully's hands. And John Scully went, hey, let's get into the software business. So they started we're building PageMaker, et cetera. They actually, another company had started up called FileMaker. Has anybody ever used FileMaker here? Four of you, yes, that's about how old it is. So if, if you're a FileMaker guy, you understand there's this FileMaker thing, FileMaker is sort of like access, it's a database system, it's quite actually amazingly powerful, great for POS systems, things like that. Anyway, fast forward a little bit, and John Scully, this is my, this is my theory, is he was the Coke the Pepsi guy, so he was like, hey, we should go fight everybody, and we'll be the underdogs, and we'll fight the big dogs, right? So what he did is he split the company into two companies, there was Apple Computers, and there was Claris. 
Am I wrong? Does anybody know the story better than I do? This other thing happened. Anyway, so when that happened, he took all of the software and put it into Claris, and the idea was Claris would go after Microsoft, uh, and the, uh, the hard, Apple computers would go after IBM. That's sort of how I see it. So Claris went around buying up all these other cool products. One of the things they bought was FileMaker. Fast forward a little bit more, and the web came into being. When the web came into being, of course, Bloom, uh, a, a little web company started, and they realized, hey, we could use this FileMaker thing to build websites with, that'd be cool. And then, of course, in 1995, the G3 came out, uh, and uh, Claris homepage came out, so you, the idea was that now you could actually use a WYSIWYG. Remember WYSIWYGs, what you see is what you could get, um, to build websites with. And then a language got built. So a company called Blue World started a language called Lasso. Has anybody heard of Lasso? The one other guy in the room, exactly. That's what the percentage of people that have heard of Lasso. It's like Swahili, right? Um, does anybody speak Swahili? Okay, that'd be terrible. Anyway, the idea now is, is that Apple actually took all of that intelligence and licensed it and shoved it into Claris, and it became Claris Dynamic Markup Language. So it became the Mac language, the first server-side Mac language. Fast forward a little bit though, and Jobs went back to Apple, and the first thing he did, you guys have all heard, read this book or read the story, is he killed all the products with the exception of a few. One of the products that he killed was Claris. In fact, it changed his name to FileMaker, and it still went off, still around. But Lasso kept on going, and in fact, there's a huge community of Lasso developers that develop Lasso, and it's sort of like PHP. Fast forward a little bit, and you've got this, this sort of lost language, but Swift comes out, and Swift open sources. Now, the father of the Swift, of the Lasso language, is actually standing in the room. He's standing over there. Um, when he was a little kid, he wrote the first version of Lasso. And in fact, he and I were sitting in a bar having a beer, and, uh, and I said, or he said, I can't remember who it was, I'm gonna take credit for it. Um, when Swift does this and they open source, like, it's gonna kill us. Like, that's the end of the Lasso language, because all the Apple people and all the service side code and all these engineers and everything they're building Apple stuff is are all gonna move. Well, we said, well, why don't we take all of that engineering talent, our company, all the people, and shove it into Swift, rip all the guts out, and take all of that knowledge and expertise over 20 years and attach it to Swift. So we did. And we called that marriage perfect. So we released this. We rebuilt it completely in Swift with the same logic and the same intention, the same ideas. With all of that understanding of what are the core things that you need to build websites, what are the core things you need to build mobile, and of course have a huge backlog of, of great code in C, et cetera, which we're gradually moving over. Um, and Perfect, of course, went bananas. It's great. As of uh, this week, we have, uh, last month, over a million people got to hear about uh, Swift, uh, uh, server-side Swift. Uh, we are now the third most popular project in the Swift world. And we've had articles and everything from uh, Wired to the next web, and you name it, it's absolutely crazy. We, are, we have this incredible popularity for server-side Swift. I'm very proud of it. But I'm Canadian, this is now in Canada, and I wanted to apologize on behalf of all Canadians for popular things. Um, just because it's popular doesn't mean it's good. And I accept that, right? Um, but I also want to say, I accept that, but I also want to say just because it's popular doesn't mean it's not good either. Um, I just, uh, the fact is we have a great team uh, of people behind it, both an agency and Lasso itself. And we've merged that together. Kyle and Lucas are actually here. So what is perfect? Perfect is a full suite of tools for building backend stuff using Swift. So there's a library of all sorts of things. We'll talk about what that is later. There's also a perfect server. So there's an Apache plugin we're working on Genix and an IIS. So you can actually use it on a, uh, in a production stack. Uh, you, uh, and the idea is not, instead of using Linux, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, you'll use Linux, Apache, Mongo, and perfect, possibly in the future. Uh, of course, there's a standalone HTTP server, especially for developers. You can just spin something up really fast on, on its own port. Uh, we have a developer app to just make it simple for people, especially iOS developers. If you've done some iOS work and you haven't done a lot of server-side stuff, you can use this to quickly get yourself up and running. And of course, classic data source connectors and we're spitting these out on a regular basis. So the idea is, is that this was what my world looks like in the future, Xcode or whatever the IDE that you use. And instead of having to flip back and forth between IDEs, doing front and back, front and back, front and back, you use one IDE, you've got a, a server that allows you to quickly spin up, you've got a data source that allows you to spin up, and you've got all the pieces that you need in order to develop. Makes sense. Uh, we also have the ability to deploy, as of today, on Docker, Amazon, Heroku, and are working with um, Pivotal at the moment to put it out on Cloud Foundry at the end of this week or within the next couple of weeks, as well as Bluemix. 
Um, so you can now you can take your code and then deploy it anywhere simply and easily from there. From there. Uh, last but not least, I'm very proud of the fact that we are, we're working with OpenSwift. The, uh, another popular, if not, I think it's the second most popular uh, project, which is called Vapor, uh, is sitting right here. So if an atomic nuclear tanner won't stand up and wave the crowd, this is the man. Uh, if a nuclear bomb was to hit this building right now, we would, uh, it would take out most of the server-side Swift world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that there's no problems there. As I know there's a Bernie convention down the street, so you know, anyway. Uh, Needless to say, we're working together with all of the different server-side Swift groups, all of the popular uh, projects that are out right now to see if we can find a standard so everybody can work together. So the idea is everyone's gonna have all their frameworks working together in the future. I'm really proud of that idea too. Uh, so now what you've got is this new thing, where I'm a developer, I've got my developer box, I am writing Swift code, and I can either A, send it up through the Apple Store and make an app out of it, or I can B, compile it and stick it on a server. That server can have a front-end web server. It doesn't need to. You can use a standalone server. Uh, you can connect it to Apache, like I said, or anything else. And on the back, if, you're using, if you want to write a website, you use Mustache. You don't have to. Or you can just write an API and just spit out, say, JSON directly. So. Here's what I see the future looking like. I'm really, I, I, I think this is, this is interesting. If we have and can use Swift on the server, we can also use it, of course, for gaming uh, or on a game platform, which is Apple Television, Apple, uh, TVOS, and also for wearables, as Apple does more and more wearables. And of course, across the whole mobile world, um, you know, last week, Google started talking about actually moving or putting Swift on Android as well. Uh, and of course, we've also talked to the Mozilla Foundation what, in, unofficially. Uh, the possibility, because LLVM is behind Mo Mozilla as well, the possibility of running Swift native in the browser is also possible. So I can imagine you, you make an app in Swift, just a classic app for an iPhone, and now you can take that code or a percentage of that code and put it anywhere else and use it anywhere else. So the promise here is I build my app now today I can build an app and use a lot of that code or at least have synergy between the code that I'm writing on the front end, on the back end, and across all of their applications. And it's native, it's not five or six steps up. Once all that happens, I believe it will be perfect. This is why we chose the name. It's not meant to be descriptive, but rather uh, aspirational. I just want to talk about one app, and I'm going to showcase this today because this is interesting. This is using Perfect and should come out in the next week or so, or just in beta. I just use, this is using Perfect on the back end, which is we have everything from authentication, uh, notifications, uh, all the classic things that you would use on the server side are all here. And this actually uses a similar system to what Cassidy was talking about. And this monitors the emotion, looking at thousands of photographs of people uh, at any, at, so during a, at a video speed. Actually playing a video, it will identify what emotions you have during that video, uh, and you can share those videos with your friend or talk with your friends and watch what their emotions are. Not necessarily friends, but you can think of things like uh, doing a job interview and I can watch whether the person's angry or happy and tell from their, the micro changes on their face what's actually going on. And this uses all, everything from web sockets to, to uh, connections, everything that you could possibly get a server to do, this is doing running Swift right now which is super crazy neat. You can share all of these emotions. I did this a few hours ago, I asked for some examples. Um, this is literally a couple of hours ago. You can see somebody who got really, was really happy, somebody else out there. The one that I find the most interesting is this person who looks really happy, but from micro expressions, they're actually very angry that they had somebody look, taking a picture of them when I asked them. Um, so I think that that's very interesting. So to do just quickly before I pass it off to Kyle, I wanted to say, look, if anybody's interested in getting involved and engaging or stressed or, or helping us, because this is really nascent, we're talking three months old or right at the beginning, and you want your name on a really cool project or work with us, anything, we're looking for any examples, anything, we will super support you. Some of the other guys that are using uh, Perfect and, and Swift right now, we're providing a lot of support for them to make sure that we can show the world that there's all these great apps out in the universe. So, over quickly to Kyle, the father of Lasso and now perfect. <clears throat> Hello, I'm just gonna quickly go through what it takes to uh, install perfect and get started with server-side Swift development uh, very briefly here. 
this example requires a, a Mac, Xcode 7.3, uh, which installs Swift 2.2. Uh, you can do this on Linux, but, uh, and I'll go through the instructions for that as well, but uh, this illustrates basically on a Mac. So we are hosted on GitHub. This is a completely open source project. Uh, we've done a release 1.0, which is what we're pointing to right here, and this is the stable version of our API. We've got a lot of great stuff in the pipeline in a lot of different uh, branches coming up, but uh, for this right now, for stable development using Xcode 7.3 and Swift 2.2, you want this release 1.0. Uh, so you download that and open it up. What this gives you is our entire project. It gives you all of the examples, all of our database connectors, uh, some extra goodies, the servers, and the core library. And we're gonna open up the examples workspace and uh, again, Xcode 7.3, that's what it requires. So here you're gonna get a window with our uh, examples workspace. You'll see a variety of projects there on the side. We include a WebSockets server example, which is what we're gonna go into. We include a, an example that illustrates our URL routing, a simple tap tracker, which includes an iOS application and a server, which shows how they work side by side together, and you can run them both in Xcode in the debugger. Uh, upload enumerator, which shows our handling of uh, kind of more complicated uh, web multi-part forms. Uh, authenticator, which shows how to do simple digest authentication even for your iOS app. And so for this particular example, we're gonna select the WebSocket server target and we're gonna run it. And what you see down here in the corner here is that things were successful. It uh, loaded libraries from the perfect libraries folder. And as part of that, it loaded the WebSocket server and it started the HTTP server on port 8181. And perfect includes, as Sean mentioned a little bit, it includes a built-in HTTP server, which includes SSL out of the box. It includes a fast CGI module, which is compatible with Apache 4.2. But the FastCGI server, which is another flavor of the servers we include, will listen for any FastCGI connections. So if you have an, any other FastCGI connector, it makes it flexible. And the way Perfect works is you see these individual examples when you compile them, and they consist entirely of Swift code, it generates a dynamic library which gets thrown into a folder, and when the perfect server loads, it loads whatever's in that folder, so you can kind of mix and match individual elements that you want to put in there in your solution. Perhaps you have a, a solution which requires a certain uh, authentication library, and you can place those in this folder dynamically, and they get loaded at startup. Uh, so a, as part of the project, just kind of as a convenience, this is not a deployment scheme, but we have just an OS 10 window that pops up and kind of shows you what's going on. So you can see that you've got your server listening on port 8181 with no particular address. And then you can uh, click there on the button to kind of pull up the root uh, index HTML, HTML or what, what have you file. This particular example is WebSockets. <clears throat> And what it does is it show you, shows you this simple HTML file, and you can enter in text and send it to the server, and via a WebSocket connection, it will echo it back to you. And this could be the basis for a chat server or any of the various mechanisms that people use uh, WebSockets for. <clears throat> this shows, at its simplest, the code required, and there's two slides. One, two. So every perfect module needs to implement this particular function, which is called perfect server module init. And in it, you do various things like set up your routes for various URLs and the things that are gonna handle them. Um, so this first section is kind of a boilerplate. Uh, in this case, we set up a uh, wildcard handler that's gonna spit back the index page, no matter what you access, unless you access echo, 
and echo is the entry for the web, web socket connection. Um, so this is all from the example code. Uh, I, I tend to think it's pretty well documented. Um, it shows you accepting, it shows you uh, implementing a handler which accepts the connection in the handle session. You're given a request in the web socket. You read a message. You make sure you're not closed yet. And then you echo it back out. And uh, this is the basis for which we've used for the Smirky app, which was illustrated just a little bit ago, which uses web sockets pretty extensively for negotiating the uh, video chat connection before it hands it off to a turn server. And um, uh, that's the basis. We include a variety of other examples, and I always find that just running the examples is kind of the easiest way to get started with the project. Uh, we have Tap Tracker, you tap it, and it shows you the location of the last person that tapped the button. Uh, we have uh, Authenticator example, which is another iOS and server companion here. So it just shows you a simple registration and login system. Uh, upload enumerator, which shows you how to handle multi-part forms within the server. It's a pure web server example. And we have a few others which don't have any like visible interface, for example, the router. So Perfect uh, includes a, a great deal of functionality, but it's everything that you, that we've found that people need when they want to go set up a server. Uh, just a variety of networking, even uh, local socket networking. Uh, we've included, as I mentioned, web sockets. We also included, uh, more recently, a very nice um, iOS notification system using their new API, so you can set up a server that's gonna send uh, notifications to your iOS device. It's been working very, very well in our testing. And, um, and again, we have a variety of database connectors, uh, MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB. Uh, we have plans also for um, ODBC and possibly a native Oracle connector. Uh, we also have uh, MySQL in the box for any sort of configuration stuff that you might need. So that's it. I just wanted to show the examples a little bit and how easy it was to get started. Yes? Uh, given that everything is quite new, how does the performance compare to the previous every day? And short uh, question would be, do you consider the difference between the production ready? If not, uh, what's the roadmap? As far as performance, we've seen very good performance from Swift, uh, particularly using the 2.2 release, which was just formalized pretty recently. Um, we've done testing of our system, comparing it uh, mainly to Apache, and using just the pure web server, it performs just a little bit under Apache, but not far. I mean, it's, the differences are a little bit negligible. If you go and use the, and again, this is using our, our built-in web server. If you go and use the fast CGI connector, <clears throat> we see the same results we use from our other system in that uh, fast CGI, while it does give you a great deal of flexibility, it introduces a lot of overhead. So uh, there's a little bit of decision there. We've investigated uh, building a native Apache module, which also has Swift kind of embedded into it. Um, but we haven't done any progress on that. And as far as stability goes, uh, for production, we've finalized, and luckily, Apple has released the 2.2 uh, release of Swift for Ubuntu and OS X. And uh, so that's what we've been uh, finalized on for production. As we mentioned, we have the Smirky app, which is going, uh, which is in uh, beta now. Uh, but we also have another one as well, which I can talk about. Uh, and we're, we're finalizing these backend systems on the 2.2. Um, that said, we've done a lot of work in our in the new branches on our system for the 3.0 release of Swift. Uh, there's quite a few changes, and uh, we hope to release that within the next week or so. But um, again, those, these are separate releases, so for right now, we advise people to use what we call our 1.0 release. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so maybe a little bit evil question, but in the world of Node.js, Go, Kala, is there a place for server-side 
I think the, yeah, okay. In, in the world of many server-side languages, such as Go, Scala, uh, Node, not so much. <laughs> But it was, PHP does perform pretty well for some things, but it's not very pleasant to use. Um, what's the place for server-side Swift? And that's a good question. Um, I don't, I just personally do not like JavaScript, and I would never consider using it on the server. I think if you're gonna use, if you're going to build a big system, I think you really, really need a statically compiled, type checked language. Um, otherwise, you're just guessing what you've broken when you make a change. Uh, with a type check language, you can make a change and if it's a breaking change that broke your system, you're not gonna be able to build the system. You're not gonna get out there and hope that things still work. And I see that as the major advantage. Um, the other one is Swift is natively compiled it's built by the guy, Chris Latner, who built LLVM, which is the basis for Clang and all of Apple's tool chains. He's, uh, he's done a, a, a lot of great work in an open source project, bringing in a lot of people who have uh, brought in their knowledge of optimizers, code optimizer, optimizers, and things like that. So I, th I think, you know, is it there yet? That's something that uh, you need to decide. We've decided it, and of course, you know, when you make a decision like that, you, you, you know, stake the success of your project on it. But um, I don't know. It, it's a clean language. It doesn't have a lot of baggage. It has a lot of great features. And you know, how does it compete, particularly with something like Go? I think which uh, is probably its major competitor. And that's something I can't necessarily answer for you. Thank you for the question. Uh, due to time, we've got to move on. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, both of you guys. It was awesome. Thank you.